Hello and welcome to Treasure Seekers. This channel is dedicated to finding the gems of truth hidden within God's Word, the Bible, His Logos. Notice what Jesus said about treasures in Matthew chapter 6. Chapter 6 verse 19 it says, Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where moth and rust do not destroy, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. You know, most people today are only seeking material things, which do not last. The wise person seeks spiritual treasure, which lasts forever. The gift God offers us is eternal life. That is the biggest treasure you can ever imagine. And it's definitely worth, worth the effort to seek God's word for these treasures and gems of truth. You know, in Christendom today, there are many, many lies and false teachings and traditions of men that have been handed down from the time of Constantine. So it does take real effort to dig for real treasures of truth. And it's not always easy. So join me as I... Dig through the Word of God, and may Yahweh and Christ bless your efforts. Hello and welcome back. In my last video, we looked into some of the reasons that Yahweh's name was removed from the Bible. The development of the Trinity in 325 CE with Constantine and how money has influenced Bible committees to remove the divine name following tradition set up by the Jews and so forth. In today's video, we will look into the Masoretic Bible translation and its sources and how it developed over time. The scriptures were so important to the nation of Israel that a special class of scholars called Sopharim developed during the Second Temple period from about 500 BCE to 100 CE. The primary task of these scribes was to preserve Israel's sacred traditions, which served as the foundation of the Jewish nation. The Sopharim were followed by a second group of scribes who began copying the Sopharim tradition. They were called the Tenayim, also known as repeaters and teachers. They were the rabbinic sages whose views are recorded in the Mishnah from approximately 10 to 220 CE. The period of the Tenayim, also referred to as the Mishnaic period, lasted about 210 years. The Tenayim, as teachers of the oral law, are said to be direct transmitters of an oral tradition passed from teacher to student that was written and codified as the basis for the Mishnah. The Tenayim were the last generation in a long sequence of oral teachers that began supposedly with Moses. The Mishnah, in Hebrew means study by repetition or to study and review, is the first major written collection of the Jewish oral traditions known as the Oral Torah. It is also the first major work of rabbinic literature. At the beginning of the 3rd century CE, in a time when, according to the Talmud, the persecution of the Jews and the passage of time raised the possibility that the details of the oral traditions of the Pharisees from the Second Temple period from 536 BCE to 70 CE would be forgotten. Most of the Mishnah is written in Mishnaic Hebrew, while some parts are in Aramaic. Judah Hanasi, or Judah the Prince as he was called, was a second century rabbi and chief editor of the Mishnah. He lived from approximately 135 CE to 217 CE. He was a key leader of the Jewish community during the Roman occupation of Judea. From about 200 CE to 500 CE, a third group of scribes called the Amoraim began to preserve the Hebrew text. At some point in this period, meticulous rules were developed to preserve Old Testament text in the synagogue scrolls. Finally, about the 8th century CE, we come to the group of scribes called the Masoretes. Their diligent efforts helped to preserve the Hebrew text as we have it today, which is called the Masoretic Text. The Masoretic Text is a very good and faithful text of the Hebrew Bible. However, it is not perfect. The Masoretes themselves recognized the inherent possibility of human error when copying the Hebrew Bible. They attempted to combat errors by adding innumerable notes, or masorah, in the margins of the manuscripts to safeguard the text. Where they found differences between texts, they determined which opinion was correct. One good example is when they came to the name Yahweh in the Bible. In the marginal notes, or the Masora, they tell the reader not to speak the divine name, but to say Adonai instead. 
We've discussed why they do that. They think it's too holy to mention, but that's one example of the Mazora. These decisions related not only to verses and words, but to every single letter. These scribes attempted to gain consistency by establishing rules on how to articulate the words when reading the text aloud. We know the proper pronunciation because of the system of chanting symbols and vowel placement established by the Masoretes. While the Masoretic text was written sometime between the 7th and 10th centuries CE, it was based on a meticulously preserved oral tradition and the best available manuscripts of the original Aramaic and Hebrew texts. So by the 6th or 7th century CE, the Jews had access to many Hebrew and Aramaic texts to use for their Masoretic Bible, but they also relied heavily on their oral tradition. Well, what is the oral law, and is it from God? Orthodox Jews maintain that when God gave Moses the written commandments, he also gave him a secret oral tradition, or Torah. This was purportedly a code of conduct and interpretation passed down from generation to generation. The oral law supposedly was God's instruction on how to live out the 613 commandments in the Torah, in addition to other commands in general. Interestingly enough, the oral law is now written down. Around 200 CE, Rabbi Judah, or Judah the Prince, as we mentioned before, codified or put into writing the foundational documents of the oral tradition for fear that it might be lost. Here are several points to consider about the oral tradition. First, if the oral tradition truly came from Yahweh at Mount Sinai, then it would have been completely supernatural that it was passed down for over 1,000 years unchanged. So if it was supernatural, then there would have been no need to write out the oral Torah as Rabbi Hanasi did in 200 CE. If God had watched over it since Moses, surely he could continue to do so if he wanted to. Secondly, there couldn't have been an oral law because in the time of King Josiah, they had lost the book of the law and it appears that they didn't even know what the Passover was or certainly how to celebrate it. The temple was in ruins and the king ordered its restoration. In the midst of this great undertaking, the Torah was recovered. The Bible says how Hilkiah, the high priest, said to Shaphan, the secretary, I have found the book of the law in the temple of the Lord. You can um, read about this account in 1 Kings chapter 22. The king called all the people together and they read the book of the covenant and together they renewed the covenant with the Lord. King Josiah ordered that the Passover be celebrated. The king gave this order to all the people, celebrate the Passover to the Lord your God as it is written in the book of the covenant. Neither in the days of the judges who led Israel nor in the days of the kings of Israel and the kings of Judah had any such Passover been observed. But in the 18th year of King Josiah, this Passover was celebrated to the Lord in Jerusalem. You can read this account for yourself in 2 Kings chapter 22. To summarize, the Torah had been lost as the temple was in ruins. The king of Israel and the priest didn't even know what the Passover was, or at least the details of proper Passover observance. Since the Mishnah, or the oral law in writing, speaks of the Passover at length, in fact, it has an entire major section called the Pesachim, which means Passovers, that teaches in incredible detail how to correctly celebrate Passover. It had to have been created after the time of Josiah. In fact, the instructions are so detailed that it becomes ridiculous to think that God is that mechanical. In addition, had there been an oral law passed down from Moses, it was certainly forgotten. And unlike a written Torah that could be found in the ruins of the temple, it would be impossible to recover an oral Torah. Thirdly, we find an interesting passage in the Torah that refutes the idea of a non-written Torah. When Moses went and told the people all the Lord's words and laws, they responded with one voice, Everything the Lord has said we will do. Moses then wrote down everything the Lord had said. You can read about this in Exodus chapter 24, verses 3 through 4. It says, And Moses came and told the people all the words of Jehovah and all the ordinances. And all the people answered with one voice and said, All the words which Jehovah hath spoken we shall do. And Moses wrote all the words of Jehovah and rose up early in the morning and built an, off, an altar under the mount and twelve pillars according to the twelve tribes of Israel. Could it be any clearer? God shared all his laws with Moses and then Moses wrote down everything that God told him. In Hebrew it says, kol divrei adonia, or all words of the Lord. 
There was no secret oral tradition. All was written down. And a few other chapters in the Bible that prove this is in Deuteronomy chapter 30, chapter 31, and also in Joshua chapter 1. So there was really no mention of an oral Torah. And fourth, one primary reason the Word of God needed to be put down in words was to protect Israel from deception. An oral Torah would have led to all kinds of duplicity, and many would have changed it for their own purposes. Keep in mind, the children of Israel went through many periods where they forsook Yahweh. Not only would an oral law have been abused by leaders during such a time, it would have been eventually ignored and utterly forgotten. The idea of an oral law is not unique just to Judaism. Virtually every religion has an oral tradition. The Pope's rulings become oral law of the Catholic Church. Catholics claim the Holy Spirit guides their magisterium, that is, the official teaching of the Catholic Church. Islam not only has the Quran, but also the Hadith, the collection of the reports, of the teachings, deeds, and sayings of their Islamic prophet Muhammad. Also, Hinduism is based on an ever-evolving oral tradition. So where did the oral law come from? One of the most respected Talmudic scholars in the world, Michael Rodkinson, writes in the very first sentence of his highly respected The History of the Talmud book, he says, the name written law was given to the Pentateuch, prophets, and the history of the Talmud, and that of oral law to all the teachings of the sages consisting of comments on the text of the Bible. In other words, the oral tradition was merely the customs, teachings, and opinions of Jewish leaders throughout the centuries. For instance, recently in Israel, one of the most influential religious leaders, Rabbi Chaim Kanivsky, 84 years of age, declared that iPhones and other smartphones are immoral because of how easy it is to obtain pornography on the, on the phones, and that Orthodox Jews cannot own one. In Judaism, these types of declarations are binding because it is taught that God has given the rabbis the authority to make these pronouncements. Not everything in the Talmud is bad, and not everything is good. It is just Jewish opinions and tradition. That's it. Jesus clearly did not believe that the oral law came from Sinai. He referred to it as the traditions of the elders. In fact, the Pharisees themselves referred to it as the tr traditions of the elders in Matthew 15, verse 2. Jesus rebuked the Pharisees for putting these traditions above the Word of God. And one example of that is in Mark 7, verse 9. To be clear, Jesus was not against all tradition, but against the elevation of mere tradition to Scripture status and sometimes even above it. While there are many beautiful components in Judaism, there is no scriptural support for the idea that an oral Torah accompanied the written Torah. So the Jews wrote their Masoretic Bible based on this oral tradition of theirs, which supposedly came from God, and they used as many Hebrew and Aramaic manuscripts as they had available to them at the time. However, the Masoretes recognized the possibility of human error when copying the Hebrew Bible. They tried to combat it by adding supplements to the text. In the margins of the Masoretes manuscripts, there are innumerable notes, or masora, to safeguard the text. The precision with which the Masoretes were able to preserve the Hebrew text beginning in the 7th century CE is astounding. Nevertheless, the Masoretes were not working with the original Hebrew manuscripts of the Bible. Corruptions had already crept into the versions they copied. So even though the Masoretic text is a good one, it is not a perfect, flawless text. It has been proven to have errors when compared to the Dead Sea Scrolls and the much earlier Septuagint Bible. So the Jewish claim that this Bible is sacred and without error is absolutely incorrect. Before we go any further discussing the Masoretic Bible, which was written 600 to 1,000 years after Christ, we need to look at why the Jews wanted their own Bible version to begin with. Towards the end of the first century AD, Judaism and Christianity were becoming increasingly separated. Even during Paul's lifetime, this relationship was strained. When Paul traveled to Jerusalem on his, his final journey around 58 to 64 AD, thousands of Jews believed that they were zealous for the law, as stated in Acts 20 and 21 here. It says, when they heard it, they glorified God and said, you see, brother, how many thousands of Jews there are who have believed, and they are all zealous for the law. But they have been told about you that you teach all the Jews who are among the Gentiles to abandon Moses by telling them not to circumcise their children or to walk in our customs. 
The law of Moses, of course, was put away, nailed to the cross, the death of Jesus Christ. But many Jewish Christians were still following the law. This is something the Apostle Paul had to contend with during his ministry. After the death of the original apostles, the separation between the Jews and Christians continued. The Septuagint became the Old Testament for the Christian church. However, Jews soon despised and rejected this translation. Why did the Jews dislike the Septuagint? By the end of the first century of the Christian era, more and more Jews ceased using the Septuagint because the early Christians had adopted it as their own translation. So rabbinical Judaism in its earlier stages rejected the Septuagint because the church used it. Remember, rabbinical Judaism does not accept the story of Jesus or that the New Testament is inspired of God. So we have these two Jewish groups to consider, the rabbinical Jews and the Christian Jews. The Christian Jews who lived in Alexandria, Egypt, embraced the Septuagint Bible version because it was written in their own Greek language. The Jews whose first language was Greek, such as in Alexandria and people like Stephen in the New Testament, it was their principal Bible. However, the rabbinical Jews rejected the Septuagint for several reasons. They didn't like Hebrew being translated into Greek because of how it changed some of the meanings of some of the Hebrew words. Also, they rejected, and rightly so, the apocryphal books which the Roman Catholic Church has accepted as inspired. They rejected the belief in Jesus as the Messiah and so rejected the Bible used by the Roman Catholic Church. For mostly these reasons, the rabbinical Jews wanted their own version of the Bible in Hebrew. So to sum it up briefly, nascent rabbinic Judaism rejected using the Septuagint in favor of only using the original Hebrew texts. So when the Roman Catholic Church adopted the Septuagint, the rabbinical Jews wanted their own translation. The rabbinical Jews rejected Jesus as the Messiah and refused to admit they killed the Son of God. So of course they reject the New Testament writings that condemn what they did. The translation they developed over many centuries is what is known as the Masoretic Bible today. The Christian Jews, however, did accept as inspired the Septuagint Greek translation of the Hebrew Bible, but did not accept the Greek translation of the apocryphal books. However, the Roman Catholic Church accepted these apocryphal books as inspired, and by as early as the second century, the Church Fathers were quoting from the Old Testament Apocrypha, using it in ways which imply they may have seen these writings as inspired. By the 4th and 5th centuries, the Apocrypha was used extensively and treated as essentially equivalent to the canonical Old Testament. After the Reformation, Protestants supported the Judaic canon and removed all of these apocryphal books from their Bible canon. But Catholics and Orthodox Christian traditions still accept these apocryphal writings today as sacred verse. The fact that after the first century, very, very few Christians had any knowledge of the Hebrew language meant that the Septuagint was not only the church's main source of the Old Testament, but was in fact its only source. So the Christians and the rabbinical Jews were in disagreement about these Bible versions. Listen to what Jeff A. Benner has to say about Bible translations. Mr. Benner teaches biblical interpretation through the study of the ancient Hebrew alphabet, language, culture, and philosophy. He uh, has a good channel on YouTube if you ever care to check him out. Here's what he says about the Hebrew Bible. He says, there are many factors that go into a translation which are invisible and unknown to the reader of the translation. Most Bible readers assume the English translation of the Bible is an equivalent and exact representation of the original text. Because of the vast difference between the ancient Hebrew language and our own, as well as the differences in the two cultures, an exact translation is impossible. The difficult job of the translator is to bridge the gap between the languages and cultures. Since one can translate the Hebrew text many different ways, the translator's personal beliefs will often dictate how the text is translated. A translation of the biblical text is a translator's interpretation of the original text based on his own theology and doctrine. This forces the reader to use the translator's understanding of the text as his foundation for the text. For this reason, readers will often compare translations, but are usually limited to Christian translations. goes on to say, I always recommend including a Jewish translation when comparing texts, as this will give a translation from a different perspective. 
Yes, it will be biased towards the Jewish faith, but Christian translation are biased towards the Christian faith as well. A comparison of the two translations can help to discover the bias of each. So, Mr. Benner is absolutely correct that these biases appear in both Christian and Jewish Bible translations. Both Christians and Jews have been arguing over translations of the Bible for many centuries. The rabbinical Jews deny that Jesus existed, and that bias is seen in their Masoretic Bible. Christians, of course, believe in Jesus Christ as the Messiah. So these two groups bump heads over certain Bible verses and the way they're translated. The Masoretic text plays down Jesus as the Messiah, while the Septuagint Bible supports the belief in the Messiah. So Mr. Benner's suggestion to study and compare both Jewish and Christian translations is sound advice for sincere Bible students. Before the rise of Christianity, Jewish authors like Philo and Josephus had high praise and reverence for the Septuagint translation. As Christianity grew and became the leading religion of the Roman Empire, however, a reaction set in especially among Jews in Palestine. Increasingly, the rabbinical Jews rejected the Septuagint, calling it inaccurate and misleading. So early attempts to make their own Jewish Bible hundreds of years before the Masoretic text began with at least three Greek-speaking Jewish scholars who published recensions or revised versions of the Septuagint, which were closer to the Hebrew in uh, use in Palestine. These three Jewish scholars were Aquila, 130 CE, Theodotion, 150 CE, and Symmachus, 170 CE. Aquila of Sinope was a 2nd century CE native of Pontus in Anatolia, which is now modern-day Turkey. According to tradition, Aquila, a relative of Emperor Hadrian, was converted to Christianity when he came to Jerusalem. Because he refused to give up his, some of his pagan practices like astrology, he was excommunicated and then became a proselyte to Judaism. Aquila is known for producing an exceedingly literal translation of the Hebrew Bible into Greek around 130 CE. His version is said to have been used in place of the Septuagint in the Jewish synagogues but the Christians generally disliked it. Symmachus, translator of the Bible into Greek, flourished at the end of the second or beginning of the third century of the Common Era. Symmachus' translation of the Bible won quick recognition. His Greek translation of the Hebrew scriptures followed a theory and method, the opposite of that of Achilles. He preferred idiomatic Greek constructions in contrast to other versions in which the Hebrew constructions are preserved. Symmachus aimed to preserve the meaning of his Hebrew source text by a more literal translation than the Septuagint. Theodosian was a Hellenistic Jewish scholar, perhaps working in Ephesus, who in 150 CE translated the Hebrew Bible into Greek. Whether he was revising the Septuagint or was working from Hebrew manuscripts that represented a parallel tradition that has not survived is debated. His finished version formed one column in Origin of Alexandria's Hexapla in 240 CE. In the 3rd century, Origen produced his famous Hexapla in an attempt to purify the Septuagint. After his arrival in Caesarea, Palestine from Alexandria in 234 CE, Christian scholar and theologian Origen Adamantius undertook compilation of the Hexapla, an elaborate tool for textual criticism of the Hebrew Bible containing the Old Testament written in six parallel columns laid out across each page opening in a series of large, thick codices. The project is thought to have taken roughly 20 years to complete by Origen with a team of assistants and scribes, some of whom may have been slaves. To undertake his scholarly work, Origen collected a very significant library, though we have little understanding of its precise contents today. Origen was the first Christian biblical scholar and the first Christian scholar to undertake the study of Hebrew. His Hexapla was not only a massive scholarly achievement in the early days of Christianity, but also a landmark in book history. Since the Hexapla was undoubtedly the largest scholarly endeavor in the early history of Christianity, a work so large in terms of sheer information quantity that it could only have been written in a series of large codices, the format of that book that was gradually replacing the papyrus scroll between 100 and 400 CE. In papyrus roll form, the Hexapla would have occupied hundreds of rolls and would have been virtually impossible to use, a consideration which would have assured that the codex format was used. 
It is estimated that the original hexapla consisted of about 6,000 folio pages and perhaps 40 codices, and that because of the immense cost of its production, perhaps 150,000 denarii based on Diocletian's price edict, it probably existed only in a single complete copy. Interestingly, 150,000 denarius would be equal to over 54,000 U.S. dollars today. This copy may have been preserved in the library of the bishops of Caesarea for several centuries, but it was lost in the Muslim invasion in 638, if not earlier. The handwritten manuscript of the Old Testament was like a modern-day parallel Bible and consisted of six narrow columns, uh, one Hebrew text, two Hebrew texts translated into Greek, the third column being Aquila's version, the fourth Symmachus's version, the fifth the Septuagint version with origins notations, and sixth column would be Theodosian's version. This massive undertaking was completed sometime between 235 and 245 CE. There are no existing copies of the Hexapla today, but descriptions by various church fathers confirms its existence. Near the beginning of the 4th century, the idea occurred to Pamphilus, a biblical scholar of his generation. He was the friend and teacher of Eusebius of Caesarea, to publish copies of the fifth column, for they believe that Origen has succeeded in restoring the old Greek Septuagint version to its primitive purity. This became the standard text known as the Greek Septuagint. Since the 4th century, there have been no major recensions to this version. So this new version of the Septuagint, edited by Origen in his Hexapla, was most likely when the Tetragrammaton was replaced by Lord or Curios, since Origen was a believer in the Trinity doctrine. In most Greek manuscripts from the second century and later, the name of God is not present. Rather, a nomina sacra form of the Greek word kurios is used in its place. However, interestingly, Aquila's version was different. A sixth century version of Aquila's work has been discovered. These fragments, found in a Cairo synagogue in 1897, reveal Aquila did not use the surrogate kurios when translating the Hebrew name of God. Rather, Aquila used a Paleo-Hebrew style script to designate the four-letter name Yahweh. This early 2nd century translation follows the same pattern witnessed in the 1st century Septuagint manuscripts that we've seen from my other videos. Thus, evidence supports the idea that the original Greek translation of the Septuagint contained the name of God, Yahweh, rather than the surrogate Kurios. This rendering of Aquila's translation comes from Henry Barclay Swede's 1902 book entitled An Introduction to the Old Testament in Greek on page 38. This book shows the Septuagint on the left, which uh, comes from the 4th century Codex Vaticanus, and Aquila's translation on the right side. In Aquila's translation, distinct uses of God's name can be seen. These letters are none other than the Tetragrammaton in Paleo-Hebrew script, the same usage seen in other Greek manuscripts of the first century. However, in Origen's Hexapla, the name of God was removed from the Septuagint Bible following Jewish tradition. Also, Origen wanted to be faithful to what he knew was true in his mind according to the Catholic Church's Trinity doctrine, so he removed the Tetragrammaton and replaced it with Kurios, or Lord, this explains why the earliest fragments of the Septuagint still had the Tetragrammaton and later copies did not. The Masoretic text of the Hebrew Bible as known today is largely based on the Aleppo Codex and the Leningrad Codex. The Aleppo Codex is an ancient bound manuscript of the Hebrew Bible written by the Masoretes in Tiberias, Israel around 930 of the Common Era. The Masoretes made it their special work to correct the faults that had crept into the text of the Old Testament during the Babylonian captivity and to prevent any f future alterations. The Aleppo Codex is so called because for centuries the book was kept in a synagogue in Aleppo, Syria. The Aleppo Codex is considered to be the best complete copy of the Hebrew Bible. Originally, the Aleppo Codex contained the entire Hebrew Bible, but almost 200 pages, about 40% of the total, are now missing. Anti-Jewish riots in Aleppo in 1947 resulted in the Aleppo Codex being smuggled out of Syria, and the Codex eventually made it to Israel about 10 years later. In the process, about 200 pages of the Codex went missing and are presumed destroyed. 
The Aleppo Codex now resides in the Israel Museum in Jerusalem. Since 2011, the entire Aleppo Codex, or at least its existing parts, is also available to view online. The Aleppo Codex is considered the oldest complete Hebrew Bible in existence. The Dead Sea Scrolls predate the Aleppo Codex by over a thousand years, but the Dead Sea Scrolls were not consolidated into a single book like the Aleppo Codex was. The Leningrad Codex manuscript of the Hebrew Bible is from the same time period as the Aleppo Codex. It is kept in the Russian National Library in St. Petersburg, Russia. The Leningrad Codex is the oldest complete manuscript of the Hebrew Bible using the Masoretic text and Tiberian vocalization. It is dated from 1008 CE or possibly 1009. The Aleppo Codex is several decades older than the Leningrad Codex, but as I already mentioned, parts of it have been missing since 1947, making the Leningrad Codex the oldest complete codex of the Tiberian Mesora that has survived intact to this day. It also serves as a primary source for the recovery of details in the missing parts of the Aleppo Codex. So the Masoretic Bible springs from the Aleppo Codex and the Leningrad Codex. The origin of the Masoretes extends to the 7th century CE. However, the focus on maintaining accurate copies of the Hebrew text has existed much longer. After the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 CE, the loss of many Hebrew scrolls led to a newfound urgency to produce new accurate copies. The Jews wanted to standardize a Jewish Bible of their own, so they started working on that as far back as 100 CE. Ancient biblical manuscripts are written with the 22 letters of the Hebrew alphabet and are largely without vowels. So even if there is no question regarding the letters of a given text, there still may be a question as to how a particular word should be pronounced and what it means. Likewise, ancient biblical manuscripts such as the Dead Sea Scrolls may contain no indication as to how the Torah portions and the prophetic readings should be chanted in the synagogue. The biblical text as found in the Aleppo Codex contains the Hebrew letter text along with the Tiberian vowels and cantillation signs. Cantillation is the ritual chanting of readings from the Hebrew Bible in a Jewish synagogue service. The chants are written and notated in accordance with the special signs or marks printed in the Masoretic text of the Hebrew Bible or Tanakh to complement the letters and vowel points. Between 700 to 1000 CE, the Masoretes developed a system of dots and dashes called nikudot or singular nikud. They were placed in, above, and below the letters to represent all the vowel sounds. These inserted vowels most likely provide to us the pronunciation of Hebrew at that time. Here is the Hebrew text of Genesis 1-1 written with the Aramaic alphabet. You notice there's no dots or dashes here. There's no nikodot here. And here it is again, the same verse with the nikodot seen in the text. There you see these little dots and dashes above, below, and in, in the middle of these letters. So that's what the nikodot looks like. Those are the um, signs that tell you how to pronounce the vowels. Here's another example of the Nicodot here in Genesis chapter 1 verse 9 where it says, And God said, Let the waters be collected. So the red marks are the vowel sounds and the blue marks are the cantillation marks. So that's an example of what that looks like. The Nicodot marks are small compared to the letters, so they can be added without retranscribing the text whose writers did not anticipate them. So these Nicodot accents do not alter the text in any way, but are strictly for understanding how to enunciate vowels. In modern Israeli orthography, Nicodot is seldom used, except in specialized texts such as dictionaries, poetry, or texts for children or for new immigrants. A system of spelling without Nicodot, known in Hebrew as Ketiv Mele, has been developed. This was formally standardized in the rules for spelling without the Nicodot enacted by the Academy of the Hebrew Language in 1996 and it was updated in 2017. So that Nicodot isn't used as often today. Many people believe that the Masoretic text is somehow a perfect copy of the original Old Testament and some believe that the Masoretic text was how God divinely preserved the Hebrew scriptures throughout the ages. However, historical research reveals several ways in which the Masoretic text is different from the original testament. The Masoretes admitted that they received corrupted text to begin with. Also, the Masoretic added vowel points which did not exist in the original. 
and the Masoretic text includes changes to prophecy and doctrine when it relates to Jesus Christ. The text they received and the edits they provided ensured that the modern Jewish text would manifest notable Jewish biases into the text. Working in Tiberias during the Middle Ages, the Masoretes recognized the possibility of human error when copying the Hebrew Bible. They tried to combat it by adding supplements to the text. In the margins of the Masoretes' manuscripts, there are innumerable notes, or mazora, to safeguard the text. The precision with which the Masoretes were able to preserve the Hebrew text beginning in the 7th century CE is astounding. Nevertheless, the Masoretes were not working with the original Hebrew manuscripts of the Bible. Corruptions had already crept into the versions they copied. Many people believe that the ancient Hebrew text of Scripture was divinely preserved for many centuries and was ultimately recorded in what we now call a Masoretic text. But what did the Masoretes themselves believe? Did they believe they were perfectly preserving the ancient text? Did they even think they had received the perfect text to begin with? Well, part of the Jewish tradition holds that even some of the oldest Hebrew manuscripts had been edited in several places. 3rd century Rabbi Simon ben Pazi referred to these instances as emendations of the scribes. Emendations means the process of making a revision or correction to a text. These scribal edits have been used to argue that the Masoretes were working from flawed text, which explains some of the discrepancies. Once again, uh, Jeff A. Benner addresses these uh, textual errors in one of his articles here. He says, over time, other editions of the Masoretic text were produced called the Rabbinic Bibles. These Hebrew texts are again identical to the Aleppo and Leningrad codexes, but include variations in the vowel pointings, paragraph locations, and the marginal notes, but also the addition of commentaries. One of these rabbinic Bibles is Jacob ben Chaim's rabbinic Bible, first published by Daniel Baumberg in 1525. The next major additions to the Masoretic Bible was the Biblia Hebraica and the Biblia Hebraica Stuttgartensia. The Biblia Hebraica was published in 1906 by Rudolf Kittel and was a copy of the Ben Chaim's Rabbinic Bible, but did not include the marginal notes. The Biblia Hebraica Stuttgartensia was printed by Paul Kael in 1977 and is a copy of the Leningrad Codex, but revised the marginal notes. In both cases, the Hebrew text of the Biblia Hebraica and the Biblia Hebraica Stuttgartensia are identical to each other and to the Ben Chaim and Ben Asher texts. The bottom line is that while there are many different Masoretic texts, they are all the same when it comes to the text itself. But he goes on to say here, between all of the different versions of the Masoretic text, such as the Ben Chaim text and the Ben Asher text of the Aleppo and Leningrad codexes, there are nine textual differences between them. He lists them out here. They are 1 Kings chapter 20, verse 38, Proverbs 8, 16, Isaiah 10, 16, Isaiah 27, 2, Isaiah 38, 14, Jeremiah 34, 1, Ezekiel 30, 18, Zephaniah 3, 15, and Malachi 1, verse 12. Other than these nine differences, all the Masoretic texts are identical. So, Mr. Benner is saying that the, these nine verses differ between the Masoretic Bible versions over the years. Now, that's not a lot of serious differences, but the concept of a flawless Masoretic text is just obviously not true. But when the Masoretic Bible is compared to the Septuagint Bible and the Dead Sea Scrolls, which were written over a thousand years earlier, that's when the Jewish biases become clear. Okay, I'm going to end this video here, but in part two of the Masoretic Bible, we will look at some differences between the Masoretic Bible by comparing it with the Dead Sea Scrolls and the early Septuagint Bible. So stay tuned for that, and thanks very much for watching.